Welcome back to the Contacts Coaching Podcast. We're joined today by Brendan Erickson, assistant basketball coach at William Jessup University, calling in from Tahoe on a quick vacay getaway. Coach, thanks for being here today. Appreciate you having me. Looking forward to it. All right. Hey, get us grounded here. Give us the give us the background. Give us the journey. We were just chopping it up about doing some cabling here at uh, my alma mater and my current employer, but we don't have to start there. Let's let's get into coaching and then and, and we'll come back to that later. Yeah, cool. Sounds good. So yeah, I was uh, 22 years old. My high school coach called me out of the blue one day. We had kept in contact and he goes, hey, you want to start helping coach? And I said, yeah, wasn't doing much besides working. And so I, I show up on the first day and he hands me the key and says, hey, you're the head freshman coach. I'll see you later. I got practice. And so that's how I started. And 22 years later, still in the deal, it really changed my life and gave me some purpose and direction of what I wanted to do. So I did about 10 years as the freshman head coach at Newark Memorial. We had some great seasons, good run that we had there. And now I went back to school, got my bachelor's, started working on my teaching credential. I went to University of Arizona for two years, got done there. And I uh, came back and jumped right back into coaching with them as a JV coach and then more varsity assisting. So I can, cause I knew that's what I wanted to do. I eventually get my own deal going. So did that for another four, three or four years, five years, and then got my first head coaching job up in the Sacramento area, uh, Castle Robo High School. And that, that was, it was an interesting jump for me. Learned a lot about myself, about coaching, going from a traditional powerhouse to a, a program that needed to be completely rebuilt. So did my two years there, turned that deal around pretty well. And now they're super competitive. They stayed competitive. Did my two years at Del Campo and fell into a phone call with uh, Coach Mark up at, and he said, hey, you want to come on board and help us out? And I said, absolutely. So made the jump over to Jessup and have been there for two years now as we transition to D2 this year. It's awesome. So Casa Roble. Yeah. Following Belno or were there people in between? Uh, I think so. It was, it, it was an interesting mix, right? A place where football is king. They love their football up there demographic way different than what we're looking at in the Bay Area as far as Hoopers go. And and it, it was a tough first year. We we were competitive at times, but we had some guys that decided not to play right when, when I got up there. So we had pretty much, I think we had four or five seniors that decided they didn't want to play. So we were playing with the JV team for the most part. And and we went 127. And it was like, whoa. Yeah, you learn a lot in those moments. And it's funny, Absolutely. You, mentioned the, you mentioned the football thing. So Norm Ryan, when I was the coach at El Camino my first couple of years, was their basketball coach. And then the football job opened and he left to go take the football job. And then the longtime JV coach elevated to the, the varsity coach and Belno was there forever beyond yeah. I left. But let's talk about that. So you're at Newark Memorial, who has a tradition of being successful down in, in the South Bay in Newark. What did you learn right away that you still needed to figure out besides being on 27? But there's a lot of teachable moments in that type of experience. Yeah, patience. Patience was a big thing. Going from assisting and being a freshman coach or a JV coach, the biggest thing was the extras that you have to do as a head coach running the program, right? You got to do the fundraising. You got to get engagement with the community. You got to get engagement in the school where basketball is second thought. Most, most schools, you got your football, you got your basketball, and, and those are two big things that we weren't really there. Trying to get that going was huge. You run into a whole different level of paperwork and organization. And I've always been at, the, I always believe that one of our biggest, I'm trying to think of the word here, um, one of our biggest achievements at Newark and really elevated us was the lack of turnover, lack of coaching turnover at the lower levels. We had a system in place. I need my freshman guys to know this. I need seven or eight of them to try out next year. JV, I need these guys to know this. And three or four of them are going to be, make varsity the next year. So we knew exactly what we needed to teach and that program and how that was going to advance. And I wanted to set that up real early. I need you to know these three things as a freshman. I don't need you to win games. I would love for you to be competitive. I need guys to play, need them to come back, stay in the program so we can build this thing. And I think that was probably the hardest thing to do for me. And a lot of organization, a lot of practices, a lot of spring and fall engagement, keep the kids playing, keep them engaged so that they don't run off and get whatever kids do, get in trouble or just keep them in, in the program, in the building and, and keep it going. But the fundraising, the organization, that was a whole nother beast when I first got in there. 
so let's talk about that a little bit, right? Because you are now at a university that has been an up and comer over the last 25 years itself, right? Where um, not coming in with a ton of resources. I don't know what you have right now, but back when they first moved from San Jose Christian, I think, up yeah. to Sacramento, um, how has that part of your journey, learning how to build from the ground up, served in your role as an assistant at a university that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming it's not like resources are falling out of the sky. We, I, we have a really good support system. Our AD, Lance Von Boyd, who was the previous coach to Mark Darnell, Darnell, that's there now. This guy is on the ground all the time, fundraising. We're trying to kick off some NIL stuff at the D2 level that is unheard of. So the resources were built through relationships, right? Just like everything else. Same kind of deal. We're out. We got donors that come through. We go to dinners, team dinners, fundraisers. It, it's all on a higher level, but it's all the same relationship building with these guys and being successful obviously helps that people want to be affiliated with success and what they're going to be given money or time or whatever that might be they want to go to a good cause and part of that is the culture we built within the the program itself with the guys that we recruit and the guys that play for us we got some great kids young men and they're awesome and they do all the right things guys come into our gym we might be in the middle of, of a drill right when that thing ends. We're going sh shaking hands. doesn't matter who it is because we don't know. You never know who's watching. And I think it's a great lesson for these guys. Hey, it doesn't matter if that guy's, you know, donating, you know, $50 or $500,000. I don't know. Uh, I love the, those donations would be awesome though, but that's just what we do. And it's the culture and the resources are actually pretty good. We used to play in a warehouse up there back in the day when it first got built. Absolutely. And, and now we got a sweet arena and it's just really nice. And from the maintenance people all the way up the line to the athletic department, the head of the athletics bar, they just take care of everything there. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, no, the facilities have grown tremendously. I was there, oh hell, maybe five years ago. Dorms are super nice. The new gym is really nice. I do remember the warehouse when we were playing for the section title in 2008 at El Camino. We actually went up there and practiced because okay. it opened behind in order to get ready for Arco Arena. But that's great that you have that type of support. What has the transfer portal impact been on you? A couple of my buddies that coach at other Division Twos have been reloading constantly, almost JC-esque, because you, for lack of a better word, get pilfered from above, right? When you yeah. have players that have breakout years versus... Sure the historic division two approach of either like red shirting everyone and having 23 year olds playing or being like a JC type feeder program, right? What's it been like for you guys? So for us, we had one grad transfer this past year. He left, he's at Southern Alabama, Miles Corey, awesome player, good kid. He's an all American for us. He's the only one that left. We got everybody back and we did hit the portal this past year in preparation for jumping to D2 uh, we also got some freshmen in that we are, redshirting is always an option, especially at the D2 level. But all the guys that, you know, that played for us last year, they're back. We didn't lose anybody to the portal, which I think is obviously it says a lot about us and, and coach and what, what we're trying to do. And I got brought on board. I feel, A, I, I know basketball, the high school basketball in Northern California. That was my thing, obviously, for 15, 16, 17 years. So knowing the area recruit some really high seniors right now. And we just made an offer, had our first official visit for a freshman on Friday. And a kid that has played for me in the past at my, for my AAU team. We're super excited, hoping that we get him and a couple other kids. But as transfer portal, that's always going to be a thing. And really, it's tough to say, but shoot, if you're going to come in as a freshman, average double digits, you're going to have a chance after you stick around or you go, you come back your sophomore year and now you're at 15, 16 points a game, getting eight rebounds. Shoot. You're a D one player. Honestly, I think part of that deal is if they're going to come to our place, we want to recruit division one guys because we got to recruit those types of guys to be successful in the pack West. If they're going to want to leave or they're good enough to leave or guys want them, I think it's in our interest, obviously to help them get to that level. Also, if, they, if that's what they choose, they want to do. Yeah. So you mentioned your AAU team, and can mm -hmm. you take us through your background there a little bit and then finish off your high school coaching resume? Because you mentioned, you didn't mention Del Campo in there, and I want to get a little piece of that. 
And then I want to ask a follow-up about the nature of club versus high school athletics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good friend of mine, one of the best guys I know. He'll be in my wedding next year. He had tried to get me to start a new team for a long time. And I'm like, man, after a full season at Newark, and especially because fortunately we were good, we're going to section, we're going to NorCal, I'm exhausted. And to be able to now start another team, just I was like, I can't do it right now. I got a young daughter and all that kind of going on family and just take, but he moved up to Sacramento about the same time I did. And we decided to go ahead and get that started. And lucky for us, we got some really good kids early on. Jalen Wells was our, was one of our first guys that we really wanted to grab. And, and his journey, absolutely amazing. We were fortunate to play with Under Armour for a couple of years. And last year we were on the Puma circuit. I really enjoy that part of it now, even more than I did when I was a head coach at high school, because I'm in a different role as an assistant at the college level. I'm a support guy. And don't get me wrong, we're getting in guys, we're challenging them, we're getting after them. But to be able to continue to also be a head coach at the same time allows me to try new things and the schemes and plays and stuff like that, that I might be able to take up to the next level and help out with what we're doing, whether it's an out of bounds play or quick hit or backdoor kind of deal. We're sixth year, I think, sixth or seventh year for, for Rose City. And this year we're adding Jalen Wells Elite to basically our, our top tier uh, team for that. So we're super excited for that. That's awesome. Good. I'm glad you're having that success. I'm curious about the conflict that exists as a college head coach, or excuse me, as a college assistant running an AU program. Uh, in years past, that would not have been okay. Have they changed the rules? How do you navigate that? Talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, big time. That was a, a huge rule change over this past year. NAI has always been able to do the, the club deal. And as we transitioned, I had this last year, but I guess during the meetings, the last NCA meetings, they basically said, NCA D2, you're good to go. You can coach. They also got rid of the NCA, the D D2 recruiting calendar. So it's pretty much just open. We can go and recruit now a couple dead periods, like short two or three day dead periods. But other than that, we're pretty much get to do what we want to do now. And that that's awesome too. Yeah, no, it's it, it takes me where I want to go. So I'm just going to dive in. So I don't know how much of this you've listened to, but my soapbox is I hate club sports. And, <laughs> and as a high school athletic director of a small school, we are extremely reliant and dependent on multi-sport athletes. And mm -hmm. where I struggle with the club scene isn't that it is inherently bad or full of bad actors. I struggle with the philosophical approach of you have to do this or you have no path, right? Or you have to do this. It's the only way. So you got to play year round. And the reality of the data doesn't support that. And the reality of the research doesn't support playing things year round. And I have a really tough time reconciling what has become a year round endeavor across pretty much every discipline you can think of except football. Although they've now created the seven on seven deal. And so what I love to hear is your analysis, both as a high school head coach, a college assistant and a club guy, let's, let's just say that. W what are the goods and the bads as you see it? T take us through that tension arc from my perspective, where I feel like it's a get rich quick scheme by a lot of people yeah. that are taking advantage of uneducated parents and athletes which I think sometimes overshadows the good that is done and the opportunities that are created. So anyway, there's my soapbox. Tell me. Yeah, on no, I, I hear you on that. And, and that was another part of the delay for me of getting into the club scene. Cause you see that all the time. Oh, guys promising kids things that you don't even have the resources to promise. I'm going to get you a scholarship. I'm going to get, you're a D one guy. You come play. From, I, yeah. Yeah. When we started it, we sat down and talked. It wasn't like we just went over, hung out for a night and said, hey, we're just going to start this deal up because I've seen too much of it. And I said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this the right way. We're going to get kids that obviously want to continue to play basketball and continue that journey through their life into college, number one. Number two, we're not going to lie to kids. We're not going to lie to their parents. We're going to tell them this is what we're going to offer. We're going to offer you a resources, skills, training we're not rolling the balls out. We have a system. We have an offense that we run at each level, 15, 16, 17. It's very similar and it's college style. 
one of the best compliments I got this past year was a college coach, D1 coach said, I haven't seen so many back doors ran in a game since Princeton beat UCLA in the tournament. And it's just part of the, but it's getting kids to buy in, right? And different coaching. So it is a college style that we play and even some pro stuff that we add into it. Small schools are tough. I totally get that. And I, Casa Roba was a small school as far as basketball goes. Um, and you do need guys to play multiple sports. And I'm a huge proponent of multi-sport athletes. I would love to recruit multi-sport athletes. The reality of it is what you're saying is kids don't do that anymore. They might come into high school, okay, that freshman year, they're, they're playing three sports and now their sophomore year, it's two. And now they're just locked in. Like I have to do this and you don't. You can do baseball, you can do football, you can do another sport that gets you different body movements and allows you to learn different different movements, different skills that also translate. I played badminton in high school for footwork. I was a slow six foot, not very athletic. I went and played badminton for, for a year or two and it helped with my foot speed. And so there's just another, when I was a baseball player, I never got into football. I was too small, too skinny to play that. But yeah, no, I, I always encourage guys to do that. Now, you go through club, you go through high school. What my biggest issue was when I was coaching at Newark, especially because we had some good players that would go play with the Soldiers and the Rebels and those big time teams. And it's, man, we're going to give you the same stuff that they're doing as far as these trainers and this and that you come here and it applies directly to us trainers and videos all the time. You're making 18 different moves. Like, when are you going to do that in the game? Um, but I see some benefits to it, but not so much for others. But uh, yeah, I think that doing it the right way and we're not crushing parents and kids on fees and extras and stuff like that. We're trying to get this thing dialed and it's been a work in progress, but I think for the money that it costs for our program specifically, I think these kids are getting great opportunities to play across the country in front of coaches that otherwise might not ever see them play. Yeah. And I think there's inherent value to that. And you mentioned something where I value the multi-sport athlete. I want to coach those kids. So how, as a club director, as a club coach, do you message that and support it? I had a parent this year in the fall kids of high level baseball player and he and I were talking in the stands at the football game and he's like, yeah it's, it's everybody's super supportive until it comes time to miss something and then all of a sudden they push you in a corner and want you to choose so how do you message stay authentic and support that when that conflict occurs so for example we have a kid on all who's a freshman plays lacrosse. We got a football game two weeks from now. And he's like, hey, I got to miss the game to go to a lacrosse tournament. It's dude, it's football season. And the lacrosse coaches exits. They need to understand it's football season. Lacrosse is in the spring, right? And that, even as I'm talking through it, might not be the best approach from our end if we're truly supporting this kid. But I am curious how, if you do say you support it, how are you messaging it to the kids where it's, I expect you to be playing a secondary sport in some capacity, whatever that may be. Sure. So we actually did run into that this past year in, in the spring. We had the two kids, I think two kids that were playing with the club team that also were playing volleyball. And I'm like, man, you're going into the section and into NorCal. That's it. Go do that. Yeah, we're going on the tournament. Like, I would love to have you. Obviously, one of them six eight. I would love to have you come and, and play with us. But is that is volleyball important to you? Yes. Is your team important to you? Yes. Then go do your volleyball thing. That's your high school deal. That's what you signed up for. I always, as much as I want my guys, if you're playing a high school sport, go do that and be successful with that and have fun with that. Now, if there's multiple conflicts, we're just going to have to schedule through it. We're going to have to figure it out. But I'm, I'm still a high school guy at heart. So I don't want you missing your high school stuff for my club stuff. So dive into that for me. Why? And this is where I think... I have a tough time getting out of my own way sometimes in my feelings about the club deal because I feel inherently that is an individualistic pursuit. You're on a team, cool, whatever, but it's about you, right? Where, yeah. I, feel, where I feel like at the high school level or the education level, college level, whatever it happens to be, you're playing for the team on the front of your chest, right? So talk mm -hmm. a little bit about why you said that and why you believe in that. 
you, know, you made a commitment. You made a commitment. And I think the high school commitment is paramount to everything else. And that's just my opinion. I know there's other guys that disagree, but your high school experience is, is once in a lifetime. And, and so don't miss out on that stuff. If that kid comes and plays for me and his team loses, but he's like a centerpiece to that volleyball team, that's going to, that, that, that stinks. And the reality is if you're good enough, whether it's volleyball or basketball, they're going to know. So if you miss one tournament and, and especially like it's a non-live period, oh man, come on, go do your commitment with the guys that you're growing up with. You have a team there, AAU club. Our guys are tight. They're close. They play against each other. They play with each other. It, it, we have a great environment, but it is not high school. And high school is just, again, it, it's a once in a lifetime deal. And if you're good enough for basketball, you're going to be fine in the next tournament and you're in the live periods and all that stuff. So I think that's a, a huge piece of it too. Yeah. And I would even invite you to elaborate a little more in regards to that approach. I feel like we've lost that from when I started this 25 to 30 years ago, where if you're good enough, they'll find you. And even I'll push back on the live period. It's that's not even the most important thing unless you are a top, 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 top tier guy, because they are recruiting grad transfers, and then maybe they'll dabble in the high school. So talk a little bit about how at the end of the day, your experiences are going to inform who you are. And some of these other things that really are noise get in the way of, of keeping the main thing. Yeah. So let's go back to the transfer portal. That has been unfortunately disastrous for high school players. That if you're a top 150 guy, 200 guy, you got nothing to worry about. You're going to get what you want for the most part. It, it hurts the the guys that are borderline guys. And because you're right, it now goes, I, I'm going to recruit a guy out of the portal that I already know can play at this level, right? And say he's coming from North Carolina to a mid-major. Oh, that's my guy. I <laughs> I don't need to recruit that, that position or maybe I go and get a backup guy, whatever. But between the grad transfers, the, the transfer portal, JUCO, JUCO basketball, I, I feel in California has increased dramatically in skill level. I played in what, 2001 to three at Ohlone College and we were good and competitive, but I'm like looking at these guys now and even the teams that aren't, they don't have the best records. I'm like, I don't even know if I could get on the court back in the day with these guys. They're just better. There's so many opportunities for these guys. And I always say, don't, don't mess up an opportunity. Always keep your avenues open, grades, keeping your body, doing the right things. So that when you have that opportunity, you, you don't miss it. Um, and again, these kids, especially the high-level ones, right? The ones that are at the Folsom's, the uh, Sheldon, Salesian, you're going to go play all over the country in your high school season. You're getting seen. Guys know. And I, I think a lot of things when I go watch, like if I'm recruiting and I'm watching a club team, I'm more looking at how are you reacting to the coach? How are you reacting to, to your teammates, to calls? I already know you can play. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think you could help our team or if I didn't think I could recruit you. But now I want to see those other things that maybe get hidden in high school because I got a little bit more respect for my high school coach because I'm there every day and, and it's a little different feel, right? But now you're getting coached by somebody else and somebody different. AAU, all the guys that play for us are, are starters, right? On their high school team, because you're probably not going to be good enough to play for our top elite team if, if you're not. I still can only start five guys. How's your reaction to that going to be? And we rotate that up. Some don't. You you got a system. You, it, it's there. Um, but yeah, I think that it, it's tough for high school dudes now, especially those second and third tier guys that are borderline. They're just not getting as many opportunities as they used to. Yeah, no doubt. And I want to circle back to something you said earlier about how you run schemes with your AAU team. And I'm imagining that like most club teams, you only get to practice a couple of days a week. How do you manage to maximize your time and create that environment? And I came back this summer from Australia and very similar where it's a two day a week with a one day a week game in the schools. And the U.S. model is you're playing every day for whatever the four months of the season and then you're putting it down. How, how do you navigate being efficient with limited time. And after your stint as a high school person, as a coach, how do you balance that and figure out how to hack 
time, right? Which is our only non-renewable resource. And so I've been, right. this has been my newest like creative learning moment. It's, yo, why can't we just practice twice a week and pull the trigger on that other than nobody else does it? But I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah. So we, it's just, it's a lot of breakdowns. Right, we break everything down and then pull it all together at the end. Uh, I don't know, you're familiar with the De La Salle, Frank Alaco back in the day, and they would throw that roll pass on their back doors. And Newark De La Salle, we had a huge rivalry. We would battle with each other. I think there was one year, it's a section game. I think the score was three to two at the end of the first quarter. And everybody's like, oh, it's such a boring game. It was like a it was like a heavyweights brawling kind of deal. We just knew. But they would throw that pass, and I, I wanted to teach that pass because I saw the, the benefits of it. And so we work a lot on breaking those passes down early on, and kids are like, what, when are we ever going to do this? So you'll see. Just trust. It takes trust, right? They got to just trust that this system will work for us, and it will work for you because it's not about all getting layups. You're going to get your shots. I have a lot of freedom that I wouldn't necessarily have probably with my high school teams in the AAU because you just don't have the time. Right. But we break down like two. We have an early offense, very simple, North Carolina style, swing the ball back screen. And then once that ball gets out, we get into a uh, continuous Euro ball screen action, pop dives, back doors, hit and chase, handoffs. So it, it's just playing the game after that. So we want guys that can actually play the game so that they can catch on to this stuff quick. But yeah, the, the difference between high school and, and and club when it comes to the time is obviously just huge. We get about two to four hours a week for the club and we just get in there and we just, hey, we're here to work. We're here to compete. You got to buy in and you got to buy in quick or else it's not going to work at all. Um, so, so why wouldn't you use that approach at the high school where you would in theory have greater commitment because they only have one choice? So I think the biggest part of that is, is the defensive aspect. And I do teach defense, obviously, in the AU. But I, my high school practices, they're probably 80% defense and learning how to do that part of it. And the scouting reports, when I was a high school coach, we would scout the day before. We'd have a walkthrough. We'd do the scout again. So preparation, I think preparing uh, guys in high school for the game, it just it, it, you have more time. And, and that part of it is what I really enjoy also, right? The little chess match of the game itself with another coach. Where in, in, in AAU, it's you got to have some basic principles. Switch all ball screens. Cool. Switch all screens. I, we can do that. We're 6'2 we're to 6'5 to anyway. It doesn't matter to us who's guarding who. So you can simplify. And it's it's really about simplifying with enough to be competitive and, and have these guys in good spots to, to be successful offensively and defensively at the club level. Got it. Okay. Let's pivot here for a second. Going back to the multi-sport athlete piece. What have you learned watching other non-basketball coaches that you've been able to implement into your basketball approach? Uh, a lot of it comes with like conditioning, weight, weight training, going into the room with, with the football guys or even soccer or baseball. And they're more power-based football and, and baseball, more power-based lifting for, from what I can see, Olympic style lifts, which we do a little bit in basketball. Culture building for football is wild to me. You got eight different coaches, you got your O-line coach and how these guys are all different individuals and how they're going to coach their little group and to be part of that bigger unit, right? is great to me and seeing those guys come together. And when you got a good head coach, those guys are all on the same page. And I think that is the biggest thing for a coaching staff. They got to, you don't got to be best friends, but you got to like each other. You got to respect each other. If you are best friends, it's even better, but have the same ideas and the same goals. And to see that in the football sense, because of there's so many coaches in different parts of that game, it, it's really cool to see, I think. And then I, I, I just the guys, coaches that can get guys to buy in in different ways, right? And, and different coaches have different philosophies. That some of them are tough and in your face. Some of them you guys get together and figure it out. And, and obviously their philosophy has worked for them or else they, they've been there for 15, 20 years. It works. Something works. And the guys come back and it, you pick some of those things up, just different styles of coaching. And he, when I played for him, he was an in your face guy and very demanding. And I felt like I was the same way through the journey. And I've learned to that up a little bit, especially as an assistant coach. I, I'm not grilling a dude like every day, but I'm, I'm going to go and get in your ear a little bit. Like, hey, you're not playing very hard. Let's go. And I'll see other coaches do that. And again, back to the footballs. I've seen the O-line coach get into the ear of a defensive line guy that, hey, man, you're not playing very hard right now. And to have that freedom as a coach and, and within the coaching staff, I think is paramount. 
So what have you learned then going back to the role of assistant from the role of the head coach? Yeah, that it's funny because Coach Mark up there at Jessup, he was like, one of the questions he asked, are you going to be okay? you like being an assistant coach. And I'm like, I, I've been an assistant coach for a long time. I'm okay with giving suggestions and hey, it's your team, man. I'm here to help. I'm here to offer suggestions and I'm here to teach what ultimately what you want to teach. And sitting down with the guys, we actually came up here a couple months ago and sat right at this table I'm sitting at right now and had our coaching retreat and went through what we're going to try to do this year. I get to sit back and learn. That was the biggest advantage for me as far as when I was assisting Ashmore. The guy has, what, 790-something wins as a high school coach. I get to sit there and learn every day from this guy for two and a half hours, two hours a day. And just so that for me was just awesome. So share a little bit about what you took away from that experience then, right? So you do your early years for him. Mm -hmm. pivot, have your own deal, go back to being an assistant. What have you learned from each of these, let's call them mentors that you implement in your own uh, day to day? The preparation of these, high, of, of these high level coaches uh, and the organization, they get to, especially at the college level, right? You don't have to go teach classes. This guy is dialed in. He is about winning. He's about culture building learning how he does that. I wish I could be in the office at the college more. I didn't, I wish I didn't have to teach as, teach as much, but taking away, not just the basketball part of it. Why does, how does a coach be able to really get into a dude and grill him when something happens? It's not personal. How do we know the outside sees a game and they see a coach like getting in a guy and he's like maybe yelling at him yelling to teach, not yelling to embarrass. Right. But we're fired up guys. We're fiery competitive guys. What people don't see ever is the, is the relationship building that we do as coaches outside of the gym. I'm your buddy. I'm your friend. You want to grab something to eat. Let's go. You, you, you need something. You need a ride. Let's go do that. Let's talk. Let's talk about what you want to do outside of basketball, your life, your goals. And then so that now that relationship, those guys, when, you, when you're in the fire, when you're in that battle, they already know that this thing, this thing ain't personal. We're getting after it as a group, as a unit, and you're going to lead us. But when we step out of that gym, I know that I can call this guy whenever he likes or whenever I need, and he's going to be right there for me. So I think learning how to build that relationship with the players at all levels, because it's different from high school to college. And you got men now, right? At the college level, you got young boys, young men sometimes at the high school level, and they need guidance. And if, if, if you're giving them the right guidance and, and, and putting them in situations where they're going to be challenged but can be successful and they can start seeing that success, that trust just goes through the roof. The relationship goes through the roof and being able to coach the way that I coach, you, you wouldn't be able to if you didn't have those relationships, I think. How does your day job as a middle school teacher in <laughs> your coaching approach? How does it do what? How does it inform your approach to coaching? Middle school, middle school is a wild deal. I was a high school teacher and then got moved to the middle school. So I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Patience. I, coaches, we have a hard time having to repeat ourselves, after, especially after we just gave a direction. <laughs> I'm like, I just told you. And in and, and, and middle school, it is, it's funny sometimes. I'll go through a direction like, we're doing a Scantron. Put your name, period number. That's all you got to do. I'm getting these things back. There's writing all over. I'm like, what are you doing? I just tried to explain it to you. So, but it actually helps you become a better coach because now you got to find different ways to explain it to a different kid. And, and just like basketball or any sport, these kids learn differently. Some learn by example. Some learn by watching. Some learn by doing. Some can read a playbook. Football guys can read a playbook and they got a great mind for that. And they, they get it. Other guys, you got to be able to show explain, justify sometimes why we got to do it like this. This is why. And as a coach, you better have those answers or else you're not going to be very successful. And that relationship is going to struggle too, right? That, that, that trust. He doesn't teach me the right way. And you hear that a lot. Like it, and it might be true and it might not be true, but I try to tell my middle school kids, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to lecture about this information. You're going to do assignments about this information. You're going to watch a video about this information. You're going to do a group project. You're getting exposed a bunch of different ways to the information. And we just take that and, and do the same thing, especially with, with the club or a high school or college. Just keep 
going and repetition and, and building that so you can remember when when the unit test comes. I don't have my notes. When the game comes, the game's the test, right? We're giving you the answers to the test as we roll up. You better have those ready to go once once you're in the fire. Yeah, I think it's the age demographic is enlightening, right? And the way in which you just described different learning styles, I don't know if that always makes it onto the athletic mm, floor, let's call it field, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. It's right. This is how I coach. This is how I teach. And now being in a different learning environment, it becomes a little bit more apparent that hey, this person might not be able to take auditory instruction. And how are you serving that kid? Do you have any examples of, without naming names per se, but of situations where you've had to tap into that toolbox where 15 years ago, you wouldn't have thought that way? Sure. Yeah, I actually just had one this past year, this spring and summer kid that played for us. Great kid, plays hard, but he has some some learning deals, right? I, he, he, and I, I can't remember what it can't read what, what's the one where you have difficulty reading dyslexia dyslexia there it is he's dyslexic and so he has trouble with looking at a play and I, I don't understand what i'm looking at kind of deal and so what i did with him is we would do extra film time i'd, I'd be on my prep period or my lunch period i'd, I'd say hey, hey what time's your lunch and we'd figure it out or at night let's jump on the zoom man let's go watch some film this is what you're doing this is what this is why you're doing it this is what I need you to do better. And for him, that worked. And then when we got into practice, we were able to direct that focus for him. Here we go again, right? Remember, we watched it on the film. And, and he ended up starting to get it and understand the why. He needed to understand the why. Why do I have to do it this way? Why do I have to look here and then do this? And once we got that kind of dialed in for him between focus instruction and practice and, you know, one-on-one -on -one time on the video, that allowed him to be super successful for us. Yeah, I think that's great resourcefulness, right? Because ultimately not all of them are gonna learn the same way. And I was just thinking about one of my kids that asked to watch film on a particular play for this upcoming season. And I was like, look, I don't even know if we're gonna run that. Like, I, we gotta see <laughs> yeah. what's out there on the court. Let's talk more about learning some actions and some concepts, and then we'll get to, to play development, right? Or designing, but it's interesting, right? The different ways in which you try to skin the proverbial cat. Let me go with mm -hmm. one more question, close things up here. So I sure growth mindset, right? Is really where as a coach, as a teacher, as a learner, you, you, you got to have an open mind to seeing things differently. And most of us have a very specific way in which we like to do things. And so I always ask this question, which is, what's the most recent thing you changed your mind on? And it doesn't have to be about coaching. It, it's more about, hey, I used to be dug in over here, and now I'm, I'm completely on the other side of that. And here's why, right? Especially in this time of polarized politics and opinions and the us against them mentality, most of us aren't willing to, to shift at all. So I'm always curious what people have purposefully changed their mind on and decided to put down and they have a reason for it. What would you say if I asked you that question? I think uh, that's a great question. My style of coaching, and I'll go with the coaching part of that, is it, it's evolving. It, it always is, right? We have so many resources now that we didn't have. I get a, a ton of plays from Instagram. Oh, I watch guys freaking love it. Twitter. Twitter, yes. And it's, oh my gosh, we ran, and everybody's seen it now, that Arizona backdoor play. You got a guy coming off a stagger on one side, he dribbles hard, reverse pivot backdoor. We made a killing off of that play this spring and summer. But as I evolve as a coach, early in the year, I always thought I had to be going 100. And I think early in the year, you have to. You got to be setting that tone. You got to bring that energy. I used to think that, gosh, these kids get to play basketball. I would love to go back and play. How can you not have energy stepping in that gym every day? And it's on you guys. It's on you guys. You guys got to get together. I'm trying to pull them together and get them going. I don't want to be the source of your energy. Sometimes I have to be the source of your energy. Um, so what I started to do, instead of being that source all the time, from day one to day 100 in our basketball season, early on, I'm coming in. Um, we're, we're getting after it. And my, my, my voice is up. My movements are up. We're getting in there. I'm showing you, I'm closing out on guys. I'm telling you, Oh, you don't want to take a charge. Go ahead and here, run me over. This is how you take a charge. Right. Kind of deal. 
Like, let's let's do it. All you guys can take your shot on coach right now. And I was there. I was doing that from day one to 100. And now I'm like, all right, let's, as a head coach in the high school, my last year was more of, we're going to do that for the first 30 days. I'm going to get after you. And then after that, I'm going to try and start taking steps back. And you guys be your team. I don't want, I can't, it has to be your team for you to be successful. I can't be the one and center all the time. And I'm the only voice you hear. And the second part of that is allowing the coaches, my assistant coaches to also have a larger voice. I think for me with Ashmore, because he was such a great coach and so successful, again, not only in, in, the, in wins and losses, but he's been in a ton of weddings of guys. He'll be in my wedding next year. That's the measure of success for me. Like how many guys are coming back? How many guys do you stay in touch with? We talk every single day, but that, that, that was my goal and is my goal is how can I build this relationship, still be super tough on the guy, but then also take a back seat to allow the other voices to be heard. And that's always going to be a, a progress thing. But I felt like that's been a, a huge change for me. Like I can sit back towards the end of the season. It's you guys know now what you need to do. You got to go do it. We're in the playoffs. We're in the tournament. We're in whatever it is. I'm going to sit back a little bit. I'm still going to coach you up and do all those things, but I might be a little bit calmer at the end. And early in my career, I was always on up and, and on a hundred percent. Yeah. It's a, it's a delicate balance to strike, right? Where coach Taylor's got a sign in his office that says you are 1000% responsible for the energy you bring to the space. Right. And that's for us as adults and for students and finding the balance of, Hey, we're doing this to uplift your experience versus, Hey, you're not coaching us as hard as hard. Right. And I think that's a tricky thing to, to navigate, but if you can do it well, then ultimately the athletes benefit. So appreciate you being here today, coach. Thanks for calling in from your getaway. Uh, yes, sir. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.